Now, I listened to what uh, Johan had to say about my economics background and so on. You can scrap all of that. Because what I've realized is that I really do know very little about economics. Uh, the, that, the thing that we call the economy is so big and so vast and so extremely complex that it's impossible for anybody to understand the economics. So thank you very much, Nay, for all your graphs. But all your graphs are just a small snapshot of something small at the moment in time somewhere. Sort of the whole thing sort of fits together, I guess, attention, but we just do not understand. Nobody understands the economy. The economy is not about graphs, it's not about uh, formulas, it is not about exchange rates and interest rates and things like that, although economists like to use those sort of things. The economy is about one thing only, and it is about people. And if you can somehow get a formula to predict, predict people's future behavior, then you will have a good economist that is able to predict the future. Economists cannot predict the future. So what I'm going to talk to you about this morning, I've got a few headings. I want to talk about the past 100 years, what's been happening. That's the easy part, because at least that happened. We're pretty sure about that. We're not 100% sure about that, but we're pretty sure about that. I'm going to have a look at the current international environment, what's going on there, the way I see that. I would like to refer also back to a little bit what's happening in South Africa and the lessons you can learn from South Africa. Um, then I want us to go through some basic economic lessons that we forgot. So let's just go through some, a few basic economic lessons and then I am going to make some predictions about the future. All right, let's get back. The past 100 years. I would say that the past 100 years was the most amazing 100 years for humankind. And go back and look at a couple of numbers. If we go back 100 years ago, do you know that more than 90% of people living on this planet 100 years ago lived in abject poverty? What is abject poverty? It means more than 90% of people alive 100 years ago went to bed hungry on a regular basis. That is abject poverty. Today, it is less than 10%. We've made astonishing progress the past 100 years. And let me start off by a prediction that current trends, we are probably going to see that there's zero, no more abject poverty in the world within the next 10 or 20 years. With one of the exceptions, primarily countries that's experiencing some wars, for instance, but poverty, we have we have overcome poverty. Poverty, pretty much, will be something of the past. The second thing, and equally important, because that encompasses a lot of things, is that life expectancy 100 years ago in the rich world, in European countries, they, they were the rich guys, were roughly about 45 years. That was life expectancy. Life expectancy in the rich world and in most other countries today is about double that and rising. And there are people sitting in this room here this morning that is probably going to live to about 120 years. It will keep on going up. And that has some implications. If you're going to retire at age 60, which has been the habit, if you're going to retire at age 60, when you reach the age of 90, you certainly will run out of savings. So we will have to look at the way that we live completely different. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. Something about the international environment. Why is it that we achieved these amazing things the past 100 years? Well, I guess there are a couple of reasons and so on. We've made some amazing breakthroughs. I'm going to touch on some of those made amazing breakthroughs. But something that happened is that we decided on a set of rules, especially just after the Second World War. After the Second World War, a number of rules were decided on. And those are the rules for things like, for example, from now on, a human rights will be important. From now on, the protection of private property rights will be important. From now on, the state has a certain role. The state will protect individuals, and the state will protect individuals' stuff, their property. From now on, we will have an international organization, a human or an international parliament, called the United States. From now on, we will have international monetary institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and the like. And from now on, we will have a world currency and we call it the gold standard. Those are the sort of things that we decided to do just after the Second World War. And it was an amazing time. 
where the economic economy just expanded and grew and wealth creation happened everywhere. In fact, the past 30 years was the most exciting time in the history of mankind. This Chinese, only the Chinese, succeeded in uplifting 600 million people out of poverty. We have never seen so much wealth creation in the history of mankind, especially the past 10 years or the past 30 years or so. But that gradually I see some cracks in this agreement. Gradually I see some cracks in this agreement because politicians started getting uh, running states in a different way. The original idea where individuals were at the center of the universe, that idea is not with us anymore. There is somebody else in the center of the universe today, and they are the career politicians, and the career bureaucrats, and the career central bankers. They are the important people. Because politicians started spending like there is no tomorrow. With that, they increased the tax burdens on the economy all over the world, dramatically. With that, they increased the debt burdens of the economies quite dramatically. Central banks got more and more powerful, and they started interfering in the allocation of all sorts of financial assets. They started deciding about things, like, for example, interest rates. They reduced interest rates even to below zero. In some instances, so today central banks are responsible for the banks, for the economy, for the financial sector. Central banks are even important and responsible for employment today. And people are realizing this. People are realizing that us, the individuals, are not at the center of the universe anymore. And we see some shifts internationally in terms of politics. We see, for instance, for instance in Europe, Brexit. As an example of that, a shift to the right or to the conservative or more nationalist. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on those terminologies, but it's the movement to more nationalism, away from the status quo. Brexit is an example. What is happening in Italy is an example. What is happening in Spain is an example. And whether you like him or not, Donald Trump is certainly not part of the establishment. And people voted for Donald Trump. And many other examples as well. So there is this fracture, political fracture happening internationally. And part of that, I would argue, has to do with this original idea of the individual being the center of the universe being replaced by something else. There are two major threats I see coming internationally from an economic point of view. The one is <coughs> certainly the so-called tra trade war, which also has its roots in nationalism, the trade war between Donald Trump and the rest. I'm not too concerned about that. I'm not too concerned about that because I think sanity will prevail eventually, and I don't think it's going to be too disruptive to the world economy. It will, in the mean, in the short term, of course, impact on things like, for example, exchange rates of emerging currencies, for example. It will impact on things like, for example, capital flows, but I'm not too concerned about the trade war. More important is what central banks are doing internationally. After 10 years of an exceptional loose monetary policy with very, very low interest rates and things called quantitative easing, which essentially simply means we print money out of nothing, they're doing the opposite now. So interest rates will be going up internationally, and the, remember this new terminology, quantitative tightening as they start sucking money out of the economies again. So that is potentially a bigger threat to the world economy and to world financial markets, especially coming from the United States. Central banks get it wrong quite often. So that is the biggest thing as far as I'm concerned from the international environment. Just a few comments about South Africa. Now, there are very important lessons I believe that Namibia can learn from South Africa. And the most important lessons that Namibia can learn from South Africa is not to follow the examples of the South Africans. The past 10 years, the past 10 years was the most destructive time for the South African economy, primarily because of politics. We had, we had a political force that did immense man damage to the South African economy, and I can go through a lot of things. The state-owned enterprises were gutted financially. The state-owned enterprises like, for example, ESCOM, which was at one stage considered to be the best utility in the world, is but a shadow of its former self. ESCOM, if it hasn't been for ESCOM, the South African economy would have been 10% at least larger. 10% of the South African economy is about four or five Namibian economies. Would have been at least 10% bigger 
if ESCOM was properly managed. Why did that happen? It happened because of politics primarily. It happened because we have a government that is so-called, they rediscovered the liberation uh, credentials again. They are in the, uh, the influence of an ideo ideology called communism, especially a certain kind of communism, namely Leninism, and that led to the deployment of cater, cater deployment, and that created this environment that we call today state capture. The impact on the South, the South African economy was devastating. And for the past five years, on a per capita basis, South Africans have been getting poorer. South Africa, an unemployment level is roughly, this, uh, roughly about, depending on what definition you want to use, but it's reaching, getting close to about 30%, and unemployment will keep going up, and poverty will keep going up. And when poverty goes up, and when unemployment goes up, it creates more and more social and political tension. And that creates an environment for populist politics. And that's why you find stupid things like, for example, expropriation and all sort of state interference in the economy because our politicians ran out of plans. And the reason why the South African economy is where it is today is because of the wrong political interference and because the, the state's interference in the South African economy. Please do not follow the South African example. Do something else. And here are some suggestions. Some lessons in economics. What is this thing that we call the state? I would argue, and of course I am I'm, I'm ideologically quite loaded, so I admit I believe, in, I believe in a certain ideology, and I do not believe in some other ideologies, and we can debate that. But from my point of view, what is this thing that we call the state? And I would say that the state does not exist. A country does not exist. A country or a state is simply an agreement between people. Yes, traditionally and usually, we as people decide that this piece of geographic area is a country. And we create an institution, we call it the state or government, to manage it according to certain rules. But we can change our minds and we can change this agreement and it has happened many times and it continues happening. Like, for example, look at Sudan. It was a country, and the next day, it's two countries. Why? Because people changed their minds. So a state is nothing but an agreement between individuals. And by the way, the same goes for a company. A company is not something that exists. A company is simply an agreement between individuals that operate in based on a certain set of rules. So what are the functions of the state? There are two functions of the state. The one function of the state is to look after people, protect people. And the other side function of the state is to protect people's stuff, their things. That's the role of the state, and nothing else. And remember what the state does. The state monopolizes violence. When we decide to create a state, we are prepared to give our right to self-defense, for example, to an institution called government, and government monopolizes the right to use violence, and we agree to fund the state, provided the state uses that violence to protect us. And that's the essence of the state. And if the states, a state becomes itself, starts becoming a predatory state, where the state starts taking our stuff away, then the state loses its legitimacy, and we must ask the question if we should keep on funding the state. But that's the nature of the state. That's the one lesson in economics. The second le lesson in economics, and this is going to sound a bit boring, and it was referred to by Renan in a way. The second lesson in economics is that what is this thing? Why, why do we have something called an economy? I said economics is about people, but on a commercial basis, what is this thing called the economy? And there's only one thing that really matters in the economy, and that is transactions. Now, that might sound boring, but think about this a little bit. Think about this, is that if there are two individuals, or two businesses, or two agents, enter into a transaction, that moment, both 
agents gain from the transaction. And we create wealth out of nothing. Because I win and you win. So a transaction is the closest we can come to a free lunch. And if you really want to grow your economy, what you need to do, you must reduce the cost of doing transactions. And the more you make it easier for people to transact and to do more and more business with one another, the more wealth we create, essentially, out of nothing. So if there's one answer to get any economy going, it must be to reduce transaction costs as much as absolutely possible. And let me give you one example, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, of something that is reducing transaction costs at an astonishing rate. And that's the evolution of money. Money makes it easier for people to do more and more transactions. And the more the cost of money is reduced, remember in the past you had to carry a, a pocket full of gold, for example, it was cumbersome, it gets stolen. It's difficult, or if you don't even have money, like in a barter economy, it's so much more difficult and so much more costly to do a transaction. But the lower the transaction costs, the more transactions we do, and the more we create wealth out of nothing. And this is an important lesson in economics. And that there was a comment also about protectionism, that's why we should be against any form of protectionism because <coughs> two individuals or two companies or two groups or two agents, if they want to do a transaction, please do not prevent them from doing a transaction because if you prevent them from doing a transaction, you are preventing them from creating wealth. Very important lesson in economics. I'm touching on a few lessons in economics. One important lesson in economics has to do with taxes. Now, we've had some significant changes to our tax regime in South Africa recently. And we started introducing more and more taxes and we're going to see even more taxes in South Africa. Now, remember, if you introduce taxes in your society, in your economy, it's like throwing sand in the wheels of the economy. It's like increasing the cost of various transactions between individuals or agents, which will always, without exception, will have a negative impact on economic performance, taxes. But some taxes will have an even worse impact on the economy than other taxes. And a very good example is so-called capital taxes or double taxes. A tax on dividend, the dividends of companies is nothing but a double tax. A tax, for example, on capital gains is nothing but a double tax, but not only a double tax, it's also a tax on inflation. Capital gains tax is an example of an immoral tax. Please be very careful when you change your tax regime. If anything, make your tax regime simpler and easier to administer and not more cumbersome and please not more taxes on that. <laughs> what is this, what is that key to the economic growth? There must be something that can get an economy going. And of course there are many things. People will say that you must do A, B and C, privatize, liberalize, all that sort of stuff. Yes, we have to do all of that, and I'm not going to repeat all those things. But there's one key in economics that can get economic economies growing that always works without exception. Unfortunately, this key and the result of this key to economic growth takes time, and sometimes it takes generations. And that key to economic growth is world-class, the best skills development system that your country can offer. If you want to grow your country over time, you must invest and you must create the best skills development system in the world. Now, I intentionally call it a skills development system and not education, because we quite often confuse 
skills with qualifications. Those are not necessarily the same thing. We in South Africa, we produce a qualification called matric, 500,000, half a million of them every year. That is a qualification that means basically nothing. Because our the quality of South Africa's education is not only bad, it is sometimes the worst in the world. In particular, world-class skills development, primary skills development for girls especially, is the key to future economic growth. So if I can buy advice on something, is put all, just about all your effort in creating the best skills development system the world has. Another one that I want to just make a comment about that you all understand, and that's about risks and rewards. <clears throat> People say there's a lot of risk doing business in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and believe me, there's a lot of risk doing business in South Africa. We can define risk in various ways, but I think we should turn this around. Since we all know that there is a lot of risk in doing business in Sub-Saharan Africa or doing business in South Africa, we also know that there are a number of very successful business people in South Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Why is that that there are so many very successful business people despite the very risky environment? And the answer to that is actually quite simple to understand. If you're a business person, in a risky environment, and it doesn't matter what kind of risky environment it is. If you're a business person in a risky environment and you are capable of identifying your risks and you can manage your risks, then you will get the reward. So that's the key. Do business in a risky environment, but you must be streetwise, essentially. You must be able to identify your risks and you must be able to manage your risks in successful time. And then on economic lessons, the last economic lesson I just want to touch on, and I'll get to my final comment. And that is, if you look at any economy, if we wash up on, on a beach, all of us one day, how are we going to start a new economy? What is this new economy going to look like? And I can tell you, I mean, I've got a pretty good idea because there's a lot of examples in history on how economies were started. And the first thing that we're going to do if we wash out on a new island is that we're going to start in the dirty industries. Well, first of all, we're going to become hunter-gatherers. We're going to walk around, <coughs> kill stuff and eat it. That's what we're going to do. That's what we do. We have to survive. And then the first step in becoming a modern economy is that we will get involved in the primary industries. The primary industries are the dirty industries, typically. The dirty industries are, for example, agriculture and mining. Those are the two major dirty industries. So we start sticking stuff out of the ground, we start putting stuff into the ground, and that's where the economy starts. That's the beginning of modern economies. From there on, the economy will move into a second phase. And the second phase is we will take whatever is produced in your primary industries and we will add value to that in your secondary industry, typically manufacturing. A good example is I've got a sheep and I take the wool of the sheep and I make a jersey in my secondary industry. I add value to the secondary industry. From there on, the economy grows a little bit further, or expands a little bit further, becomes a little bit more uh, modern, modernized, and we move into the tertiary industry. Using the, the, the wool example again, so you produce the wool in the primary industry, you net the jersey in the secondary industry, and you sell the jersey in the tertiary industry. Now, if you look at the economies, how economies evolve, if you look at the status of the modern rich economies in the world, you will find poor economies are primarily primary sector-based economies. Growing economies move into the secondary industries, the manufacturing industry, and rich economies are basically in the tertiary industries. Very interesting things that are happening. One is, is that the so-called dirty industries are reinvest inventing themselves. Agriculture is an excellent example. 
where the actual value add in agriculture is not really happening on the land anymore, it's happening in the lab somewhere, or at the university somewhere, or a new patent that has been discovered. Because the, if you look at the piece of land today, it's the same piece of land as 100 years ago, but the production in some instances is more than 100 times more on the same piece of land compared to 100 years ago. The land is still the same, but what happened is, you put two things in this mix that were not available 100 years ago. The one is know-how, management skills. The second one is technology. So agriculture, usually being, a, as an example, a dirty industry, is actually moving into the tertiary industry and it is becoming skills-based. Very importantly, many of these tertiary value add that is happening, a lot of that, and in fact you are all involved in this, can be digitized. You all have cell phones, you download music, you download news. My daughter is a geneticist, she will analyze the genome of a, um, of, a, of a plant or an animal. She will write a computer program on this and she will email that to somebody else. My daughter can digitize life. And that is where the future is. And that is how economies evolve. And if you for one moment think that value and wealth is a piece of land, you're making a very big mistake. It is what you can do with that piece of land, what really matters. Then about the future. What's going to happen in the future? Well, I don't really know, 